Yes, today we have with us the Deputy Chief of Mission Israel Embassy here in Delhi, uh, Faris Saeb. And you're welcome to ETV Bharat. Thanks for joining us. And Thank you very much. this conversation, of course, straight up, let's talk about the West Asia crisis, the tension that's escalating there. Uh, first was the Gaza situation. It's been a year. And now, of course, the Lebanon situation. How do you view this? What is Israel up to? And uh, is there any, uh, no, my, my the very crucial question would be like, you know, what potential pathways to exit or, you know, uh, for the de-escalation of tension between Israel and Lebanon? Your take on that? Well, you started uh, mentioning the the, the conflict uh, with Hamas in Gaza, and uh, our stand there is very clear. Uh, we still have 101 uh, hostages held by Hamas, and till we don't have our hostages back, and till we are not sure that Hamas won't have any more military capabilities, the the the, the war against Hamas won't stop. This is clear. Um, as you all know, since October 8, uh, Hezbollah uh, decided to join the terror effort of, uh, of Hamas um, as both are Iranian proxies and started firing, launching missiles over Israel since October 8 uh, without any provocation from Israel. We haven't initiated anything against Hezbollah at that point. And then they started to do that, uh, joining the effort of all the proxies, of course, uh, add to this the Houthis in Yemen and add to this the militias in, in Iraq, and you got like a multi-front uh, war against Israel that started the same day. Uh, we decided, because we wanted to concentrate on releasing our hostages on the conflict against Hamas, uh, that we are not going to respond with all our power against Hezbollah. Um, and since October, October 8th, Hezbollah is launching missiles almost daily over Israel. Uh, we saw the tragedies that happened lately with the missile that hit the Druze villages in the Golan Heights, killing 12 children. Um, unfortunately, personally, five of them are related to my family. Um, and then uh, Hezbollah started firing on Israeli cities and citizens, and not only on the north where we somehow we try to tolerate it. We have almost 80,000 Israelis who are outside their houses and we want them back. So the question is not uh, where we are taking this. The question is what's the end game of the other side of Hezbollah, where they want to take it. We don't want this war. We don't want this war, especially not with Hezbollah, especially not against Lebanon. We don't have anything against Lebanon. On the contrary, we see Lebanon as a neighbor. Personally, I think uh, a peace with Lebanon makes sense uh, for many reasons, uh, but it won't happen with an Iranian proxy in, in Lebanon right now. Um, I really hope that the situation will de-escalate, uh, that uh, the other side will understand where this thing is going, and they will step back actually to the United Nations Resolution 1701 that state that Hezbollah need to be on the Litani, far from the border with Israel, and the Lebanese, legitimate Lebanese army will take control on the south of Lebanon. This is where we stand now. So uh, you mentioned about the Gaza conflict. Mm -hmm. It's been a year now. So uh, where are we heading? Uh, what is the way forward? Probably I would ask you. And what is the Israel uh, government up to when it comes to the Gaza conflict? Is there any, uh, you know, of course, uh, pathways to de-escalate the tension? Uh, are we going to see any kind of peace prevailing for that matter because the international community is really concerned about the situation because there are a lot of geopolitical implications rising out from this particular conflict. So your take on that. How can we talk about peace when you still have hostages, when you still have a terror organization who's still in control and is still, you know what, is, they don't have only 101 Israeli hostages there. They are actually holding the local population, the, the, the Gazan population as hostages, using them as human shields, using them to protect their uh, assets, what's left of their assets. The, we can't talk about peace now until the moment that we understand that on the other side, Hamas doesn't exist as an organization, as a power. Um, after that point, we can start discussing what will happen the day after. 
the involvement of international uh, community, the involvement of uh, moderate Arab countries, the involvement of a moderate Palestinian leadership. There are many things that can be done, but it won't happen without those two elements, having our hostages back and eliminating Hamas as a terror uh, mil military, military power in Gaza. Okay, uh, coming to the second question, mm -hmm. of course, let's talk about the India-Israel relationship. Sure. How do you see the relationship going forward with a lot of changes? Uh, of course, there has been a, a, a shift in the geopolitical situation currently. Mm -hmm. How do you see the India-Israel relationship and how do you plan to cooperate further? Uh, one of the reasons that uh, I applied to this position as a DCM is because being an Israeli diplomat now in India is... Uh, is a great opportunity um, because we are handling, we are discussing, we are having conversation with our Indian part, counterparts on almost all levels and in so many fields. Um, since I arrived here, just less than two months, I had the opportunity to meet people uh, who are handling the um, technology and startup scene here in, uh, in India. Um, of course, the classical fields of uh, agriculture and water, and now we are talking about health and uh, cooperation between uh, academies, uh, the connection between people to people, that is very important. Uh, both countries uh, have a vision of the future. Uh, now that India is, let's face it, it's not the India of uh, 30 or 40 years ago. It's a nation that went to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, we also tried. <laughs> Um, but of course, we have so many fields that we can cooperate in. Um, I'm talking about uh, trade and economy. We are talking about uh, a strategic um, uh, project. Of course, connectivity is very important for both of our countries. Both countries um, experienced, uh, unfortunately, terrorism. But on the other hand, we also experience very good relation with uh, with other nations around us. We all. Uh, want to see peace happening in our region, uh, but with the reality that we have now, uh, we always check which kind of new fields we can discuss together. Um, I think that uh, the next step with India should be translating all the dialogues that we have, the, all the positive uh, energy that we have between our countries into reality, more agreements in more fields, um, and I think that the future of uh, our country is very bright. So, um, of course, talking about India's stand, we have seen that uh, India was the first country to condemn this particular conflict. But at the same time, uh, India has been pushing for a two-state solution, as you might be knowing. Uh, we have a good relation with Israel as well as with Palestine, for that matter. How do you see India's role? Uh, you know, what role does India plays, uh, or you think that India might play uh, in resolving this conflict? Or is there any, you know, what would be your take on that? Um, well, it depends on India. It depends on the Indian leadership, um, where, how do they see the role of India in global conflicts generally, not only about uh, West Asia. Um, but we do see India as a very moderate voice in international uh, organization and community. Of course, we would like uh, India to um, help us in uh, in the effort of not politicizing the international organization, because this is what what's happening now. We see Palestinian and some other states are trying to push to politicize uh, organizations that are not supposed to be political, like uh, international communication organization, uh, uh, professional uh, health organizations, things like that. Um, and we want India to stand with us on, in those cases. Supporting the Palestinians is, is, is fine. Um, you can support the Palestinians, you can support the people, you can support um, a thriving society without being against Israel. Supporting the Palestinians doesn't mean being against Israel. On the contrary, we want the Palestinians, the Arabs in the region, to have a, a better life, to have a brighter future. Um, the vision of uh, Foreign Minister uh, Katz, when he was the Minister of Transportation, the idea of building a seaport in front of artificial island as a seaport in front of Gaza that actually will serve 
the Gazans and the Palestinians, it, it was his idea. And he spoke about it when he, when he was the Minister of Trans Transportation, and he's talking about it now as the Minister of Foreign Affairs when we talked about what w might happen the day after. This is an idea. Instead of trying to find, in, in a very small country, Israel is a very small country, trying to find another location for another seaport, here's an idea that will serve all of us. So supporting the Palestinian is not, we're not against that, on the contrary, of course, but we want uh, a much more pragmatic approach toward us from our friends, all our friends. And we can't deny that the relation between Israel and India now is a, is a big friendship that we are pushing it even forward. So let's talk about the mobility partnership agreement. I like mm -hmm. when on a special request from Israel, we have sent our Indian workers to Israel for the mm -hmm. construction workers. Of course, you might be, yeah. and I'm like, multiple of them has already left. And uh, there are multiple reports coming in that uh, the Indian workers are facing issues there, like the scale issues or whatever. What is Israel doing to ensure their safety? First of all, we have um, different levels of agreements. The agreements between business to business and government to government. And the agreement that we have in the governmental level are supposed to handle all the issues that were raised lately, especially in the media. Of course, there are some uh, exaggerations about that. Uh, the Indian workers that came to Israel, many of them are uh, a high level. Of course, what we will want to have in the future is maybe a slightly different approach, is having not only Indian individual workers who are coming to work in Israel. And then it's hard to monitor, especially that now we have around 10,000 uh, Indian workers in Israel, okay. and uh, there are more that are supposed to come. The idea is to have Indian companies uh, coming to Israel for infrastructure uh, projects, and then they will come with their, of course, uh, experience and uh, specialties, and they will come with the, uh, specialized Indian workers. So it's a, sec it's a different approach that uh, we're also trying to, to push forward. It's, we just started uh, so how, having... Like, uh, like how Israel is waving those Indian workers, are they uh, good at scaling or like uh, what's going on exactly? Well, well I can't go into details because I don't know exactly the details, I just uh, was exposed uh, as, uh, as all of us to the reports in the media. Uh, talking to, also, like, to, to friends and of course to, to associations in Israel uh -huh. who are working with the Indian uh, labor, the, the, the general uh, opinion is that it's very positive. Um, of course, as a new project that is happening, you will find some um, gaps. The, the way things work in Israel is different how they work in, in India, so it takes time for this system to adapt to new ideas, to new methods, things like that. The general opinion is very positive. We want more uh, labor so from I India. Asked, I asked about the uh, safety and security. Of the ah, organic safety and security. The, we treat all foreigners in Israel, if they are workers, students, um, expats, as any other Israeli citizen. Mm -hmm. um, we have the uh, home front command instruct, uh, instructions in different languages, Hebrew, Arabic, English, uh, and other uh, languages that are more common in Israel. Uh, they are safe uh, where they work in each location. There is safe, uh, like safe, uh, let's put it, rooms beside each uh, uh, location. Um, when, in, when we anticipate something, of course, the, all the messages go out. So the safety of, the, of all, all foreigners in Israel is, uh, is secured by our, uh, our forces, security forces, the IDF. So the, the instruction for the Indians is that we treat them exactly as any Israeli citizen in this regard. So uh, no, we talk about, of course, uh, this is something that the entire whole, uh, whole world is staring at, of course, when you talk about the conflict. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of back-channel diplomacy going on with India, uh, with India as present when it comes to resolving this conflict? Uh, for that matter, because we have seen India's role when it comes to the Ukraine conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen uh, how India has been you know, pushing for peace. And uh, similarly, we saw uh, India's stand when it comes to Israel-Palestine conflict of maintaining international humanitarian law uh, that India has been pushing for. So uh, do you have anything to say on that? Well, as I said, our, uh, our dialogue with, uh, with our uh, friends in India is, 
in all levels, in all issues, without going into the details, of course. Um, not everything happening in uh, the diplomatic world can be spoken, but we do see India as an important partner. Uh, we do see India as a moderate voice. Of course, India also have the connections and relations with countries and with organizations that Israel is not part in those organizations. So we want our Indian friends to be the voice that give also our voice in those uh, places. I think that India can play a role. Um, and as I said at the beginning, um, it's in the hand of India to decide where, they, where the Indian government want to take their role into in global conflicts and, of course, including West Asia. So I have a very cru crucial question, of sure. course, uh, depending on a few reports, of course. Uh, there, you know, uh, Indian weapons uh, probably are reaching Israel and uh, Israel is using it. Uh, any, any say on this when it comes to the Gaza conflict? Any, anything on this? Any confirmation? Is it true or what's going on exactly? I. I can tell you what is the Israel's only secret weapon. It's its people. When the conflict started, more than 30,000 Israelis left uh, trips abroad, uh, studies, workplaces, and flew to Israel to be part of um, protecting our country. Um, what we have with our friends internationally, of course, we keep for ourselves and our friends. Um, we thank any government, any nation who support us, and it doesn't matter in which level. Um, as I said, Israel is not only in a multi in, in in a war against the proxies. We have also a huge international campaign in international organization against us, and there we need our friends. We have a media and social media campaign against us, and here we need assistance to our friends. Uh, there are so many ways to, to try at least to give the truth about Israel. Um, and here I think it's even much more important than other things that you mentioned. Okay. So uh, it'll be very much uh, useful for our viewers to just tell us, you know, maybe you can give us a brief as to how this tension escalated, you uh, know, how the conflict started between uh, Israel and Lebanon and also, of course, uh, so can you give us a brief as to how the conflict evolved and what are the geopolitical implications when it comes to Israel's relationship with the neighboring countries? Yeah. We have a very strong uh, two peace agreements uh, with Egypt and with Jordan. With all the challenges that we have, of course, we have uh, disagreements in certain issues, but still those two peace agreements are very important to us. In the past, we spoke with the Syrian government about having a peace deal, and of course, everything collapsed, uh, especially after the Arab Spring in 2011. So if what, there was any chance before that, the the region changed then. Um, the peace with the Jordan and Egypt survived many challenges and it will keep going on because it's important for all of us. Um, so even within this conflict we see the, of course, with the criticism and with the, the, the discussions that we have, uh, still also Jordan and, uh, and Egypt stand behind the, the peace agreement and uh, protect it the same way that we are. This is important for all of us. Um, we really hope that uh, when this conflict de-escalate, we will have uh, back the discussion with Saudi Arabia, okay. connecting the entire region with the, the Emirates, of course, that also, again, with, with, with the disagreement in certain issues, we still have very strong a connection and relation with uh, with the Emirates and Bahrain, uh, with Morocco as well. Uh, peace in the region is something that we are not only wishing for; we are working in maintaining it and enlarging what called the Abraham Accords and the peace process. It's important to us. Um, this dynamic um, is supposed, and we really hope that uh, will help in maintaining the stability in the, in the region. But we have a very strong 
a side that is pushing to the other side, and this is Iran. Iran has an ambition in the region. Their ambition is partly religious, uh, pushing the revolution, the Shia Khomeini revolution, into the Sunni world, even before Israel. Sometimes I think that uh, Israel is just an excuse to, to Iran uh, to radicalize the Sunni world for their own interest. Uh, they are financing um, groups that destabilize the entire region. We're talking, as I said, Hezbollah, Hamas, Islam, Jihad, the Houthis in Yemen, the militias in, uh, in Iraq, Syria. Let's see, the destruction of Syria. Hezbollah and the Iranis has a huge part on this. So with the Iranis pushing forward, uh, we need our friends to push back. Um, regarding the, the escalation uh, with Lebanon, as I said, the, the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, not Lebanon, even though that we, we think that the state of Lebanon should be held accountable to what's happening in their, it's a sovereign country still. So they need to be accountable to what's happening in their own area, in their land. Mm -hmm. We want the Lebanese army to take control. Uh, so our conflict with Hezbollah is long going. Uh, since the 80s, uh, in the, before Hezbollah it was the Amal Shia group and based on Amal, Hezbollah was created. Um, Hezbollah is responsible for the death of uh, 350 Americans in 83. A, in a huge a terror attack. They are responsible, I think it was almost around 50 French uh, peacekeeping uh, forces that were in Lebanon, also in the 80s. Uh, Hezbollah is responsible for the terror attacks in um, Argentina and Buenos Aires against the Israeli embassy and against the Jewish uh, center. They are responsible for the terror attack in Bulgaria. So it's not only a local Lebanese terror group. It's a, an Iranian-financed global terror group that have also a political wing that tried to play inside the Lebanon political sphere. Um, to get rid of Hezbollah is very hard. They, have, they managed to build an army, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, that's why what we are asking for, what we are pushing for now, it's not even disarming Hezbollah. We're pushing for... Let's have 1701 that push Hezbollah to the Litani River, far from the Israeli border, and at that point, the conflict will stop. This is, this is the minimum that we are asking, but this is what we are pushing for. Uh, and here, if you asked before that about uh, uh, what could be India's role, mm -hmm. it's joining our friends in the international uh, community to push Lebanon and to push Hezbollah and to push the Iranians actually uh, to accept 1701 and to have it on the ground. So, uh, you know, given the situation, given the, uh, the kind of situation we are into, the conflicts happening all around the world, mm -hmm. uh, are we heading to an all-out war, I would ask? <laughs> um, I'm optimistic by nature. Um, I think that eventually the, the leadership will, will be pressured only by the people. Um, and we need more voices that ask for peace, that ask for stability, that push the leadership towards um, connecting with others. Um, that's why the idea of connectivity, it's very important. Um, Connecting India to Europe through uh, Saudi and through Israel, with Jordan in the middle, with other uh, countries and other forces that will join this positive dynamic, it will lead into a better future. Sorry for the cliché, but um, if we decide to join the other side that pushes into a more totalitarian uh, regimes and into radicalization, things will, be, will look different. I'm still optimistic. I still see the good on people. And I think that eventually there's the only solution, the only way that we can proceed is by having peace and stability. Right. My last question, of course, you talked about uh, connectivity and there was mm -hmm. a very, uh, you know, an important project that was initiated during uh, G20, yeah. uh, 
that's called the IMEC, uh, the India Middle East Economic Corridor. How do you see from the China's perspective? Uh, as we know that China's aggressive uh, nature, of course, the influence in the region. Uh, we have seen how India and other countries are, you know, are doing the best to encounter, you know, to counter China's uh, growing influence. How do you see, and where does we, uh, you know, where are we now exactly when it comes to the IMEEC project? Uh, where does he stand? The the project itself, uh, as I said, it makes sense. Um, it makes sense to, to India to be connected with Europe through sea and land. It makes sense to Israel to be connected back to Asia, as for many years we were not part of it. We were pushed toward Europe. Are we progressing well in this particular project? Um, there are a few things on the ground, but I think that nothing will happen at uh, the moment okay. till the leadership will take the decision to take it forward. And of course, we need some kind of de-escalation in our region. We, we are very sincere about it. We understand this. Um, we do want this project to, to proceed. We do want our uh, neighbors to be part of it. We do want India to lead it as well. Uh, it's important for us for that India will be one of the leaders of, those, of this project. It's, uh, it, it will contribute to uh, really connecting the two regions and not um, and not only keep it as a very nice uh, dialogue between countries. India has a very crucial uh, role uh, in the, to make this project, you know, doable. Um, as I said, I'm optimistic. We as Israelis, uh, optimism is something in our nature. That's uh, that's why we we thrive despite everything uh, happening to us. Um, so I want to stay positive, and I want. To, to see this project, at least during my three years here in India, uh, happening or at least starting to, 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 to be on the ground. And you see on the uh, current uh, India-China relationship, uh, of course, when it comes to China's, uh, you know, I've already yeah. mentioned, <laughs> any, any take on that, any comment on this? I, I think that uh, India now has a uh, harsher uh, neighborhood than it was a few years ago. Uh -huh. uh, and as uh, the biggest democracy in the world, um, India has a stand, especially again when it comes to um, totalitarian regimes like uh, we have in some countries here in the neighborhood. Um, and this is, uh, and I think that in this case, uh, India need to be the, um, the moral campus of the region. Um, I know that India has a very good relations and connections with uh, the neighbors in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean, uh, that India is trying to uh, be the leading voice of uh, stability and reasonable uh, geopolitics here in the region. Uh, you asked about India role, India as an emerging power, as a country that has the potential to become one of the most important global powers, uh, need to decide its own agenda in the region and to go forward. I'm optimistic about the future of India, and as I said, I'm optimistic about the future of the relationship between our countries. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us. I'm this Deputy Ambassador. Thank you for the promotion. Thank you. Thank you.